So hi everyone, welcome back again. Um, so you know, we basically decided this year to kind of try to open up the conversation a little bit, so it's not just kind of presentation after presentation. So I'm gonna try to keep this panel like you know pretty pretty conversational. Um, we're gonna have like a Q and A session after that, so you can like ask questions. Um, I want to introduce to you uh, Laura Bliss. Laura is a, a staff writer for City Lab, covering transportation and the environment. Um, she also authors Math Lab, a bi-weekly newsletter about math that you should all subscribe to. Um, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Los Angeles Magazine, and beyond. Um, to her left is Andrew Nicklin. He's the director of data practices at Johns Hopkins University Center for Government Excellence. Um, he works at the intersection of technology, government, data, and civic engagement. Andrew has been called an innovative thinker and skilled technologist. Um, and uh, to his <laughs> Michael agrees. To his left is Michael Schnurla. Um, he is the chief data officer for uh, Louisville Metro Government. Uh, he collaborates with government, citizens, and private-public partnerships. Um, and he pools resources and collects products that benefit multiple entities at once through the open data portals. And then to his left is our own Jeff Verzocco. Uh, Jeff is our senior customer success manager at Cardo here, and he has a background in design that has led him to do mapping in transportation, journalism, and urban planning. He works with open data and geo communities to, facil to facilitate new ways to leverage um, the many interesting public and private data sets uh, into deeper city experiences. Um, so I basically kind of the larger goal of this conversation is to walk back, um, you know, to walk us back a little bit from kind of the more technical, you know, spatial data science talks and really think about kind of bigger pictures. And in particular, what I wanted to talk about is, you know, I have kind of like this big question of how, you know, how research actually translates into implementation in city governance. You know, when as researchers, kind of the larger goal, at least kind of like the larger stated goal in our in our research, is that somehow it has like a policy implication, where the result the results and the methods can affect kind of the real world in some way. So I kind of want to dig deeper into how that actually, if it does at all, um, in in city governance. Um, so my my sense is that currently it actually doesn't translate. Uh, so well, but not really for a lack of interest. And I'm going to read this quote here. Um, this is from San Diego's uh, city uh, fiscal year 2018 city performance and analytics report. And it says, uh, so Data SD, which is the, their data and analytics team in the performance and analy analytics department, Data SD must maintain connections across hundreds of the city's primary data sources, such as mainframes and databases from different vendors, external S uh, staff providers, and spreadsheets on shared devices. So there's a lot of kind of complexity, it seems, and kind of where all the data is coming from. Uh, so you know, the bigger topics that I kind of want to touch on here is basically what are cities doing right now, and kind of what's good, and what are, you know, where are their kind of areas of improvement, and then you know, questions about data ethics and kind of how we move forward and develop kind of, you know, what do we do when we kind of move forward and we're using with more kind of ubiquitous, fine-grained, real-time spatial, uh, spatial data. So I want to start off with you, Laura. So from the perspective of a journalist who, you know, largely represents kind of the citizen and, you know, this external, this perspective that's kind of more external to cities, and what are you seeing in terms of you know, innovation in data analytics and technology in, in, in the city? Um, uh, I think it's on. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, go up. Push it up. Try that switch. On. On? Yes. Seeing headphones. Okay. Uh, cool. Well, thank you again for having me um, on this panel and at this uh, very cool event. Um, so it's a huge question, um, and I think I would start by answering this question of where is data being used, where does innovation, technology, the intersection of city governance stand, um, pointing to 
uh, the very, very long history of, of the use of data by city governments to make policy decisions and um, integrating that with technology in many cases. Um, I've been in this room before at a GeoNYC night presenting on um, historical maps, you know, dating back to uh, mid or uh, late 19th century, right, where city reformers were collecting um, housing data and employment data to um, influence the decisions of their label, labor leaders at the state level. Um, you know, I, I think to the early uh, traffic signal timing systems, right, um, of the 20th century and, and um, the 1980s, right, in Los Angeles. So I think there's a really, really long history. It's not so much something that's you know, new and happening. Obviously, many of you in the room know that. Um, but clearly there is um, a lot of pressure on city governments in the last 10 to 20 years to adopt um, philosophies of sort of smart city governance and integrate uh, data analytics into their day-to-day -day work. Um, clearly in transportation, that remains a huge area of focus and there's a sort of natural kindred between things that move and the ability to map those things that move and um, try to manage the flow of traffic better um, to housing, health, um, pretty, pretty much every prong of, of municipal governance. Is that Answer. <laughs> Actually, I let me um, let me ask you kind of a more follow up question. Sure. Why do you? Is, I feel like there um, there there are more kind of data analytics models around kind of transport, and you guys might also be able to kind of um, talk about as well. There are more kind of data analytics models around transportation and infrastructure than there are around kind of you know housing, for instance. Can you kind of speak to a little bit, or why do you think that is? Yeah, other folks in the family have better answers than I. Yeah, sure. So before I got to Cardo, can you hear? Can we turn the volume up a little bit and the, the mics? Yep. Hello? Oh, wow. I can hear myself in my head. Um, so I, w I was at Regional Plan Association before this, and uh, this was kind of before the, the real easy data science tools came out. It took a lot of researchers to do a lot of work on transportation work because it's just such a complex space. Housing is, is, is complex as well, but, but transportation is especially complex and tempting and, and really, like people want to know what's going on with mobility because it's it's really, um, it, it's complex and you can see that it affects everybody's lives on like a moment by moment basis. And so I think the reason we're seeing more happen is because there's more data about it measuring more things, the, 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 the advent of smartphones is, has kind of connected people a little bit better to the data the, the, the data sources themselves, and now some of that data is sort of being revealed a little bit, and um, I think that there's just an uptake in, in, in the transportation data that we're seeing that is, is somewhat successful, and I think the data might not, I, I'm seeing a lot of housing work happening too, but it's very much behind the scenes. I think part of the Thing too is that transportation conferences get more press, and I think housing 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 conversations get less press. But you know, hopefully that can that can change over time. So I think it's a combination of the uh, appeal of the industry and the tools themselves, and that it's just easier to kind of do things for the transportation. Um, so I also I think that's true. I think there's a lot of transportation data out there, and it's because I think you know historically you've had some sort of street lights that have some sort of potential for data. They have electricity, they have connectivity, and so it's easy to add more sensors onto those, so we're getting that data back. But also from uh, private companies, you know, ways, bird scooters, line bikes, uh, bike share, all that data is now coming into cities, and it's all mobility focused. And we're already getting some good transit data from like, the GTFS um, spec. We, we can pull that in, we can store that historically. Um, so I think the data is one thing, but the other thing is funding. So um, if you look at where the money is, where cities spend their money, it's, transportation is just historically, even at the federal level, um, where a lot of money goes. And so like I'm in the innovation office in Louisville, and we don't really have any budget, but we want to create some valuable products and then embed those in departments. And the way we do that is well, we find out where the data is, what the projects are, but also, if we do something in transportation, it can probably be funded 
afterwards because they have a lot of money. So you guys are actually, so uh, City of Louisville is actually doing a lot in the transportation space. Can you kind of give some examples of the types of projects that you're working on? Uh, yeah, so um, it's, I'd say it started, we started getting into about three, four years ago um, with some of the data we started collecting, but also from Waze. So we were one of the first Waze partners and we were able to take that uh, data feed that Waze gives to governments and they give it to city, state, and federal governments. And it's real-time data about uh, passively and actively collecting information that, you, that, that come from users of Waze. And that is everything from kind of speeds of vehicles, aggregated, of course, not, uh, it's anonymous, um, but also traffic jams and slowdowns and potholes and roadkill and all sorts of good information. And it's up to the cities to store that information from Waze because Waze actually stores none of it historically. It is kind of fire hoses, real time thing at cities. And uh, it took a year for us to figure out how to store that. And uh, we did that internally. And then we changed that to externally. And now we, we've created, created this open source platform in the cloud that any city or government can take and use. And so far, about a dozen have taken it for free. And now they're able to store this historic Waze data. So that's one of our big projects. And we're laying on top of that now, bird data, we have bird scooters in Louisville and we get that every month, uh, routes and origin destination information, and we have some smart corridors where we're now starting to get sensor data back in, and so we're building this sort of mobility uh, data warehouse where we can then make decisions on traffic retimings and where to put bike lanes and all that good information. So a lot of that came from uh, someone I work with, and we'll get into this later, but how do you get these projects done? You have to have like a, an internal leader that's willing to just keep pushing it forward over and over and run and not let it go. So one of my coworkers is an innovation project manager at Laney, and he had a tight connection to the transportation department historically, and so he's able to embed those tools and systems that we build and get them to adopt and use them. So often the role is like a political, you know, often the role of like a chief data officer and an innovation officer is like a political role as well. Um, so Andrew, you have you know over 20 years of experience in, in government, and you know Michael kind of just talked about all the different kind of complex, kind of new innovative things that they you know, they're working on in Louisville. Can you kind of you know tell us what kind of changes you've seen in kind of like the analytics landscape over like the last few decades, and kind of what is the, like the, maybe the changing role, the growing role of data science here? Yeah, I think. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. So I, I have worked in government since 1995, and I exited in 2015 or so, so 20 years straight. Um, and in the early days, the focus, at least for me, was on building infrastructure, building capacity, building technical capacity so that people could take advantage of it. And then it shifted to, well, how do we now actually use that to, to sort of serve people better? Um, and I think recently that the interesting changes come about is that the, the what was traditionally the fiefdom of statisticians and very expensive or, you know, or, or proprietary software packages has suddenly shifted and is now democratized. It's become available to everybody. Um, and that includes uh, JS tools as well as non-JS tools. Um, and so we're also now seeing the emergence of, of you know, like, like Michael's group in, in, in Kentucky and uh, across the country, the emergence of these like data science teams who are um, often centralized within government and have broad access to you know, not just one agency, but across silos, um, and really able to think about bringing data from multiple places together to start to solve problems in a much more holistic way than, ever, than has ever happened before. Um, so lots more data, lots more flow of data, um, cheaper and more accessible tools for people to use is really, I think, what's driving this, this, this culture change now. Right. Can you actually talk a little bit more about what what kind of tools you're, you know, you're starting to use? What kind of, you know, maybe you're using more open source versus yeah, I mean, in the old days, it was map info and misery, right? And and now it's, you know, there, there's a whole variety of tools. I mean, part of the one. Um, you know, there, there's no, you know, Mapbox and so on. There's, there's tons of other um, platforms out there. If you wanted to sort of bypass all that and do your own map rendering in D3, that's something you can do, right? So, like, the ability to sort of take information and visualize it um, and process it, um, tools like Python, um, you know, even JavaScript, mm -hmm. there's so much that has just become widely accessible um, that it just makes it a lot easier. And can I ask you another follow-up question? So 
I think that like you know, largely it's very positive that we have kind of this what you're calling democratization of data science. Um, you know, the fact that these tools are very accessible makes it easier for governments to kind of share information and share models. But can I ask you if there are kind of any risks in you know in especially in government and making it easier for you know for anyone to kind of run an SK learn model? <laughs> Uh, I could probably talk about this all day. Um, yeah, I don't think you have to look far to, to see the risks at the moment. Um, I mean, every day in the news media, we, we're reading news stories about how the tech sector is basically destroying society, right? About how, like, you know, Facebook's algorithm is changing the way electoral politics works, and um, you know, people's access to government services is shifting based on algorithms. Um, so I think there are a lot of risks around it. I, I think that you know, any data science work. Um, has to be very connected to both the people that it's trying to serve and also the organizations that it's trying to impact. So when I say that, I mean, you know, when we when we talk to people about their data science projects, we are encouraging them to, if we, let's say we're like changing an inspection, an inspection system or something like that. Well, the people who are affected are not just the inspectors, right? They're also the people who are being inspected. But oftentimes, the optimization is to get inspectors to replace faster and not necessarily to consider the downstream effects of what that means for those people who are receiving those inspections. And so having, uh, encouraging people to have some more conversations around that and, and, and to think about the larger audience who they're impacting is actually incredibly important. So we're, we're increasing access to the tools, but we're not yet there when it comes to thinking carefully about the ethics and, and sort of the, the downstream impacts of our work. Um, you know, there's sort of emergent uh, emerging things in, in, in the field that are sort of coming along that way, but I still think we have a long way to go. Right. Um, and I, I kind of tangential to this topic is I think like the question of reproducibility as well. You know, like once you build, like once you build a predictive model, like you know what happens to that model after that? How does it get like kind of maintained in the long run? You know, cities like to share models. Like how do these models translate between you know across? Different cities. So I know that Michael, kind of, you're really into this. Um, you're really into this topic. So do you want to talk a little bit more about kind of you know data and like you know, model reproducibility? Yeah, and also to the ethics point. Um, you know, whenever we do an analysis of some type, we may come up with some sort of outcome or recommendation or index or something. But that is just kind of our starting point. We don't use it as then this is what we have to do. We have multiple people look at that and in fact people can look at that model and outcome and say that there's problems here and this is why this is showing this other thing and so we rely on the experts in the departments and in the cities to kind of use that in some way and I know you have a toolkit as well uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, so uh, sorry what was the question? I, I Reproducibility. Yeah so, um, so like for instance we took Chicago's restaurant health inspection um, I think it was a machine learning model, and took that and reproduced it in Louisville. Can you um, actually talk about what that health inspection model is? So yeah, it was a way to optimize health inspections at restaurants or food establishments across your city so that you could catch critical violations sooner. So it kind of machine learned historic data and came up with a model to say, all right, you should go inspect these, these restaurants, top 10, or uh, whatever you wanted, um, to to optimize those critical violation caches. And so we, we repurposed that. Now that was originally written in, um, I forget what it was written in, but we rewrote it in Ruby, I think. Um, and we worked with our university in Louisville to do that. And we actually used different data sets and we kind of redid the model. And so we didn't, we weren't able to just take what they did and use it, we just used it as a springboard. I, I think that happens a lot when cities try to use other people's work. It's just like a starting point. We're about to do a fire analysis, and we're going to look at uh, New Orleans work and Boston work, right? But we're probably not going to be able to just take what they did and reuse it, because um, there's a lot of hurdles there, either internal tech skills or technology or cost or different data sets or data standards. Um, and so, so, so there are issues there. One of the things, like with the Waze project I mentioned, that we've open sourced the entire infrastructure platform in the cloud is um, another city could take that code and in 30 minutes deploy 
17 pieces of cloud infrastructure. So anyone who deploys it then is running that same platform. Um, and then you can build tools on top of that platform that we all share. So for instance, we then built a Power BI template that replaces traffic studies. You can do a traffic study with Power BI, which is free in the desktop, um, using the Waze data on this platform. And then if we just publish that template on GitHub, somebody can plug that into the same platform using the same Waze data and, and get that analysis of traffic flow uh, in their city. And I think the key there is that we're not just publishing the code, we're publishing the infrastructure and the instructions and how to use it and actually defining some really good use cases as opposed to someone trying to figure it out on their own. Um, so that, that's how we're kind of handling that reproducibility. And then we're actually working with Carto now. So Carto has built a connector on top of that same cloud platform so that you can extract pieces of the, the Waze data from your cloud platform and import it into Cardo automatically without having to do any coding. Just you plug in your filters and your database information and it can extract it and put it over there. Yeah. And, and Jeff, you have, you, know, you have a lot of different public sector clients. Can you speak a little bit about kind of what are the, you know, like what are some of like the more kind of advanced data analytics that you've seen you know, across? Um, I think I'm going to switch that question just a little bit and talk about the models that I've seen. Yes. So we've got uh, a couple of things that are happening. I, I, I see small pockets of data science teams popping up all over New York City. And it's really kind of thrilling because they're just little seeds of, of like two or three people that are doing really great things and they're just starting mostly. But then if you look at something like planning, I mean, New York City Planning Labs and the Department uh, of City Planning that took the model of 18F and has done exactly what you're talking about in a very different way. It's not exactly translatable, so there was a lot of work taking the 18F. Uh, 18F is the, is the digital wing of the, of the White House, uh, and, and they, have, they basically did a repo for all of their activities and, and their processes. New York Planning Labs just just <coughs> lifted that and, and reproduced it and made Zola, which I mean, if you haven't looked at it, you should take a look at. It's the zoning and land use map for, for New York City and about six or seven other projects they've made. And now they're making that replicable by making the GitHub repos completely open. And, and uh, I think the city of Savannah just picked it up, and the city of Cincinnati was visiting them recently, or Pittsburgh. And so you're starting to see these trends happen where they're getting around these large um, corporate or large government software systems that they've been stuck in for a long time, and that people couldn't actually do the work. And now they can get in and they can get their hands dirty and they can make things and they can make mistakes, and it's great. You know, those mistakes can lead to horrible outcomes, but that's a separate topic. But uh, I think what we're seeing is a lot of small efforts turning into a large movement. And that's always, I, I think that's always a really good thing. And the nice thing that I, I, I see happening is that the leaders, leaders are starting to pay attention. And they're starting to understand that if they give just a little bit of push, they're going to get a lot of ROI on that first round of, of, of um, you know, a, a specific data science team tackling a specific question. And then they come up with other questions, and then they look at other answers, because everybody in involvement is super smart and really diverse, and it's, it's great. Um, I, and I, you know, that, I think that's just going to kind of continue, and, and I, I think it's thrilling. Do you, think, um, do you think the New York City plan, planning lab is like a unique, like is a new, unique case of like... I mean, that's the concern. I mean, Chris Wong's leadership has been uh, definitely not a question. That, that's one of the strongest points of this, and, and you know, what if Chris Wong just disappeared for some reason? And I'm not saying I'm gonna make him disappear. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, he, if he, like, if, if he were to, you know, if something were to happen where he had to move, move somewhere else, how is that gonna continue? And it's a very valid concern. But, um, you, you know, you have to, I think someone like Chris understands that that could happen and definitely prepares for, yeah. you know, who will carry the legacy of this thing on. So I think part of that is, is strong leadership. Uh, and on all levels to be aware of the fragility of something as, as great as this and also being aware of the power of what they're actually doing. And I think like one, you know, one, one thing that some of you mentioned is that you have all these cities kind of talk to each other. So in reality, there's like a network of information sharing that allows kind of, allows like knowledge to be transferred more easily. Yeah, and that knowledge transfer is critical. Right, yeah. Um, and so actually, I, I feel like, you know, we have like a very kind of theoretical conversation right now so I it might be helpful just to kind of everyone like list a couple of a couple of examples of like just interesting kind of 
data analytics or data science or even spatial data science, um, kind of, you know, case studies. So the Department of Health here, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, at our last locations conference, I watched uh, Mahiri Ray, who is on, on their team, um, and they have a team of like 400 analysts that do all of this work in Tableau and Esri and, and, and Cardo sometimes and all kinds of other stuff. But um, just to the side a little bit, they're doing these one-off projects that are just amazing. And Didi did this um, analysis of um, dialysis centers and what would happen in an emergency. So let's say you have uh, a snowstorm and all the subways that are above ground are closed. Mm -hmm. How do people get to dialysis for the next two or three days or, or, or a hurricane or whatever? Let's say you just shut down the above ground subway systems. She did this analysis of what would happen, what like what dialysis centers would suddenly become uh, more elevated in, in, and, and have more people going to them. And that's an actual life or death situation where, where you're, you're making sure people can get to dialysis centers in an emergency situation, which had not really been thought about in the detail that she had done it, you know, where you're actually routing people to it. And she revealed this whole thing kind of un unveiled it step by step. And I, I, I was kind of slack dog when I saw it all happening. I had seen it develop, but I had never seen her tell the story. But I think, and she did that in about four days. And, and, and so something like that used to take like a month or months or however long, but you can now do it in two or three, four days. I'm just going to go down the line here. Um, we have another mobility project. So uh, we have a Vision Zero team, like many cities, where we try, we're try trying to get to zero fatalities on the roads for pedestrians and bicyclists. And you know, in order to do that, you really have to have a lot of data, and you have to analyze your environment. And so we don't have the maybe the time, the tech, the skill set, or whatever to do that. So. Uh, we partnered with the University of Pennsylvania Masters in Urban Spatial Analytics program, Ken uh, Snipe up, up there, if, we, if anyone's familiar with him. And we did a semester-long, or year-long project really with their uh, master's students. And um, what they did was they took 25 or so open data sets that we were able to pull, not from, and we put more on our open data portal for this project about like the, the roads and signs on the roads and where the street lights are and road speeds and anything about the built environment. And then we added on top of that another data set, which was the Waze data set. So we were, they were able to get some information about speed and how people are moving around the city. And they took all that and put it into a machine learning model. Um, and they went through, actually, they have a bunch of different models and they mined it historically. And they came up with a um, a map of the city, and it was an interactive online map, uh, where it gave a, not only uh, where the riskiest intersections and corridors were in the city, that where we should maybe focus some of our energies, but also recommendations about what things in the built environment were actually causing those to happen. And some of them are intuitive, like when the speed limit was higher, you would, that was a big factor, right? And so we can control that to some degree. Uh, maybe a lot, but there's other factors that you might not consider, like if there was a street sign that changed the speed limit near an intersection, that was a huge factor. And it's something you might not necessarily consider, and so that's something we could maybe more easily change, like change it after the intersection or change it farther away, something like that. Um, and they published all their code online with this very detailed blog post, so any other organization can take it and reuse it. And we're actually going to work with them this year again. The negative, though, is that the 20, the two dozen data sets we gave them, there's almost no data standards for those, so it's really hard to reproduce that in another locality. Um, so that's that's a hurdle to overcome, and that's something we're going to look at for this year. There are so many examples going around in my mind, but I guess two of them that I want to call. The first one is actually not necessarily a, a hardcore analytics project, but just more of surfacing data and putting it into a way that's consumable for people, and that can actually make a huge difference in just how services from governments are used and engaged with. Um, so Cincinnati is really well known for their opioid dashboard. Um, and what they did was really simple. They took all their, their ambulance dispatch data and ran it through some processing and then made it accessible on that dashboard. And essentially, you can see like where the concentration of calls for overdoses are in the city, and you can see that over time. Um, and that was the first part of that, was getting the data out there. And the second part of that for them was actually engaging with the communities, the community groups that are trying to support people who are overdosing or who are dependent on opioids, um, and figuring out how to 
use that data to more effectively direct their services. So whether it's like making sure that there are the appropriate um, antidote for opi opioid overdoses uh, available in those areas, or making sure that um, there's enough educational material out, out there. Um, each of those groups was able to use that data to sort of direct the resources really effectively. So that's not even, I mean, it's data science in the sense of like people actually stopping and looking and thinking about things and maybe doing some analysis in their heads, but it's just presenting information and making it accessible. So, so you know, that, there's one. Um, perhaps smaller impact, but also interesting, at least for me, is in Kansas City. Um, we, we actually did some, we actually did this work with Kansas City, so I'll, I'll preach about it a little bit, but um, there is a very, um, complicated model for residential inspections um, for issues that crop up in residential housing. And it turns out that there's a lot of inefficiency in how the inspectors do the work. And so we have worked with them to build a machine learning model that essentially optimizes when things get re-inspected. So when the inspector goes out, they find a problem, and then there's some uh, time frame, uh, it's legally something like 60 days, where in, in which those things have to be repaired. Um, but we're actually discovering that if an inspector goes out in 60 days, they're not ever going to find the repair. So then they have to go out again, and they have to go out again until it finally is. And so what we're doing is optimizing the inspector's return so that when they get there, it's more likely to have been fixed and actually create sort of less work in the long term, and less penalization for residents and so on. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's an example of, of, again, sort of working with a particular department, trying to optimize your services, and also at the same time sort of thinking about what the impacts are to residents. So those are kind of two top of examples. Um, I will kind of go back to one of the original questions, which was why does, why is transportation such a focus of the data analytics world in the urban context? And, and I think a couple of people pointed to like the um, influence of private industry, right? I mean, there's so many transportation products on the consumer facing side of things um, that rely on spatial data um, and obviously technology, some, uh, you know, many pieces consumer technology. Um, and so, Transitioning, right? Um, we think of Uber and Lyft, and of course Waze and other um, types of products that would sort of fall into this category that are generating tons of data and obviously getting a lot of attention, publicity, as someone else pointed to. Um, and you know, questionable whether you know how much we should be looking to Uber and Lyft, right, as explanations for growing congestion on city streets and other kinds of uh, mobility-related problems, like declines in transit ridership and so on, but these are definitely really pressing questions for city officials working in the transportation setting, particularly to answer. And um, so thinking about you know examples of data analytics, cities don't actually have access to a lot of the data that they need, right, to answer those questions because it's proprietary. And I know Kevin was just up here at some point talking about um, shared streets, which I think is, is tries to be sort of an answer to this question of how do you get private and public sharing data. Um, and on the Waze side, right, too, I was just, just been reporting a story. I'm sure many of you heard about, you know, these largely, like, wealthy suburbs that are up in arms about new Waze and, um, you know, GPS navigation app traffic coming through their streets and they're trying to blockade the roads and petitioning and trying to sue Google to get their neighborhoods to move off the map and Leonia, New Jersey, right, has actually succeeded in doing that because it's, it's totally banned <laughs> outside traffic, which seems like a disaster for its economy. Um, it's kind of amazing. But, uh, you know, there are people who, you know, elected officials who are actually charged with, like, trying to respond to some of these residents' concerns, right, and um, trying to work with ways, uh, you know, and, and through these data partnerships. Um, but, you know, in, even in a huge city like Los Angeles, right, like, they can't get the data they need to actually answer that question, like, what to what if, if, extent is ways impacting congestion, you know, on the streets of Sherman Oaks and Encino, um, try as they may. So I think it's important to keep that uh, as part of the conversation here since, since the sort of public and private relationship is so uh, much at the heart of what we're talking about. That's a, I think that's a really good point. And I mean, obviously, you know, like, I, I feel like there's a price for everything, which kind of for me, like personally or morally, that's kind of a slightly problematic and so if you like you know if you talk to ways or uber or Lyft, you, i feel like we probably are able to buy some of the data sometimes and that again goes to the question of like you know whether you know <coughs> is it really appropriate that like cities have to buy you know buy data about you know, how um, so it's that's actually kind of 
like transitions really well into a conversation I think about like data ethics. And so I know like I, on on the flip side, there's this kind of like elitism where you know suburbs in New Jersey don't want their you know don't want you know Google kind of Google Street View on the, you know in their towns. But on the other side, there's kind of a question about data privacy. I think that's like a legitimate kind of a, a legitimate concern to have. I know you've reported. Um, kind of on sidewalk a little bit and how, you know, they're trying to kind of create an environment where there is really just like constant and like much more ubiquitous data, data extraction from their citizens. Can you speak a little bit more about kind of uh, your reporting on sidewalk? Yeah, sure. Um, so sidewalk labs, which probably many of you in the room are familiar with, it's a sister company of um, Google or child of alphabet, <laughs> you want to describe it. Um, but their main project is uh, developing a 12-acre parcel on the Toronto waterfront called Keyside. Um, and it's kicked up a lot of controversy in the last year. It's, it's almost a year since they signed the contract with um, the sort of quasi-government agency that's representing Toronto and other tiers of government there. And um, yeah, so they're proposing, they don't like to use the term is anyone from Sidewalk Labs in the room? <laughs> um, I think fine. they tried to get someone, but they did not want to talk. would be great for her. Uh, yeah, so the proposal, they, they, they don't like to use the term, the term smart city, that's all I was going to say. Uh, but they, that's effectively what it is, is far, you know, to, to the I think, public understanding of that term, right? It's a neighborhood with, um, you know, housing, transportation infrastructure, energy systems, um, outdoor spaces uh, that um, are all layered with this digital infrastructure, right, that is collecting uh, information on all kinds of metrics to produce, you know, a more efficient, healthier, happier, more affordable place to live for the city of Toronto. Um, and I think the key thing that's really stirred a lot of concern in the advocacy community in Toronto and beyond, obviously it's, you know, as a, as a quasi Google project, it's attracted a lot of attention globally and, and publicity, maybe outsized publicity for the, the scale of the project, which is quite small actually, um, is that there hasn't really been, there hasn't really been any answer around um, not only questions of data privacy, but maybe more importantly data governance Right, who gets to keep the data? Um, you know, even after some of it may be applied to questions of um, urban man, you know, urban governance and management. Like, how do we make the energy systems run more efficiently? Well, what happens to it afterwards? Is it potentially monetized? This is a Google sister company, after all, right? Um, and there, there hasn't been clear um, answers to that question provided by Sidewalk Labs or their partners in government, um, and. That I think is creating a lot of suspicion around the project that may or may not be founded, um, but I think that is maybe a lesson for others who may be in this space <laughs> um, to have maybe clear answers about those kinds of questions from the outset. Right. Yeah. As far as I can tell, they're doing like a lot of community meetings to try and kind of get more buy-in from the community and focusing on how they're kind of kind of help like low income housing development, but they're not really kind of focusing on this key issue of like who owns the data and are you guys going to monetize on, you know, on this data. Um, but but Andrews, kind of that gets to our, you know, uh, kind of part of the reason why I wanted to invite you here, which is that recently GovX um, created an algorithm and ethics toolkit, um, which I thought, and, and I thought the way that you guys are like the medium and the method that you guys have created is really spectacular, so can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, sure, and I'll try to be speedy since we're okay. running out of time. Um, <clears throat> so I think we're kind of like the, the spokespeople for it, but it was actually a partnership between the City of San Francisco, ourselves, Data Community DC, and um, the Civic Analytics Network, which Mike was a part of as well. Um, <clears throat> and the whole goal was to, you know, sort of tackle, you know, since 2015, 2016, there's been a flood of stories in the media largely sort of like basically tackling government to the ground about why is it that people are being disproportionately treated badly, um, you know, how are services being affected and, and being affected in positive negative directions and so on, and, and they're legitimate stories. Um, but 
we're in a stage where people in government didn't have, do not, and or did not until now have the tools to understand the, the impacts and the risks of what they were doing. Um, and as we, you know, as we talk about the democracy of data science and the, and the sort of uh, the increase of that that is inevitably going to happen, as well as the increase of data and so on, there's no way that we're going to say that governments should never use algorithms. So we have to have a, a, a set of tools for governments to use them responsibly. And so that's what we set out to do, and, and we set out to do it in a way that was oriented not towards data scientists, but towards program managers and towards government executives. We didn't want, I mean, data scientists will have to answer some questions in the toolkit, but it's largely oriented to like, are you, are, are you creating a risk here that is actually too significant that you may want to consider just not going down this path? Um, and so we built a risk management framework, and we said, you know, okay, here are like seven, six or seven different major factors of algorithm risk, and, and they're sort of broken down into subcategories, and, and we create an evaluation mechanism for each one of them. And the idea is that you characterize the, the risks of the algorithm that you are putting together, and sometimes it's a combination of algorithms, not just one. Um, and then on the tail end of that, we also have a set of mitigation strategies. So if you identify a particular thing that's high risk, then we also make some suggestions on how you can sort of like control for that a little bit. I would not argue that it's going to get to perfection. I don't think that it's, you know, we, we release it in beta very specifically because like it needs to be field tested a lot more. Um, but also, like, just the field is evolving too quickly that we're not going to get to perfect. I mean, part of what I think we're trying to get to is, is it, are things better than they were before? Right. And, and I think there's nuance to algorithms. So you were mentioning before the Chicago restaurant inspections thing. It was actually very highly, uh, highly, talk, highly regarded and highly talked about because of how it, how it, um, how it improved things and how, you know, made health outcomes a little bit better because less people might have been getting food poisoning. But it didn't cover an, 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 a negative outcome that actually came out of it, which is that they were penalizing and, potentially, and in some cases closing restaurants in areas that were already food deserts. And so you are reducing access to food significantly in, in areas where there's actually a greater need for it. And is that trade-off that you really want? And I don't think it's fair for me to answer that question, but the idea is that with the toolkit, you can start to at least you know, put those two ethical questions against each other and, and get some decisions out of that. So that's what we did. So it's it's at ethicstoolkit.ai. I encourage people to check it out. It's open source, so you can also fork it. And we'd love to see improvements to it. And we want to bring those back into the main, to the main thing of how we support the governments that we work with. Okay, good. Um, and yeah, so we have two minutes left. Um, so actually, maybe what we should do right now is just kind of open up the conversation a little bit. Does anyone here have any questions that they would like to um, ask our panelists? I mean, I have like a list. Sure, question you're asking, but yeah, I think you're saying is how does money kind of affect the equation and what works and what doesn't work? Is that, is that what you were saying? Well, I think articulating what the, the findings are, the finding of these tools, um, into is based on the kind of one the recommendations to be deployed. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I think we might actually have some stuff to say about this too, but I, I think that it's always a multi-part equation. And so a data science team can go in and they can find out, you know, exactly where, what intersections are, are hotspots for, 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 um, for accidents or for collisions. And, and then, you know, you take that and you, you bring it into the political climate and then you bring it into the financial climate. I mean, and, and you look at all those things together and inevitably it becomes like a, a, a a, a solution that fits the entire uh, landscape of what's going on. But I think data science has started adding a lot of weight to the fact, right? It starts to give a lot more fact to the, to the, the, the problem. And I, that's where I think transit is kind of excelling beyond other um, parts of, of government. 
you can measure traffic really nicely now, or better than you could before, minus the Uber and Lyft um, mystery data that we can't see. But I think you can measure transportation very easily uh, in, in some cases, and that is giving more weight to the transportation. It's giving more evidence that you can actually work with to, do, to, to bring solutions to the table. I think Laura also has a. Um, this is like a, a roundabout <laughs> response to that question, I think, which is like, I, as a journalist covering data and tech, I'm always really interested in the much less obvious, I mean, I shouldn't say much less obvious, but like the human saying, I don't know, like the, what's the metaphor I'm looking for, like bits of dirt in the wheels, you know, <laughs> like kind of making things move more slowly or not quite as smoothly as you'd expect them to in like the computer model version. Um, and I, I mean, I think, you know, what I what I would read is maybe a potentially politically driven decision to invest in ferries right, over other forms of existing transit in New York City. You know, I, I don't know, I'm not sure like what, you know, if there was a data analysis of, of the cost benefit, I don't know I don't what it would say. Was. Yeah. <laughs> but, I think it was mostly interesting. Yeah, so I guess, I guess, I don't know, I, I think of another, this is very much unrelated, but, but obliquely related. Like, this, one of my the favorite stories I've, I've reported in, on New York City Transit was about this um, kind of amazing, uh, almost savant-like transit researcher who got been educated at MIT and had worked as a consultant in transit agencies all over the world and was obsessed with figuring out what causes subway delays. And so when he was working in London, he collected thousands and thousands and thousands of historic data points on when delays were occurring on this one particularly congested line and found that indeed, you know, delays start happening around morning rush hour and then they sort of like cascade and get worse and worse throughout the day. And, you know, you, you can sort of know that like from the first-hand experience of the computer. When he went to actually address this problem, what it required was months and months of interviewing operators who actually work the trains. Um, and he learned that, <laughs> uh, you know, human the human need to take like pee breaks, <laughs> like not just responding to you know large crowds that were holding the door open, but but just essentially human needs of the operators that were holding the doors open longer and causing de delays. Um, and there was this mismatch that he found between how the like service planners had planned the increments between the trains um, and what the operators actually needed. I think it's kind of a good example. It doesn't actually answer the very question at all. <laughs> but there's always this sort of human component that um, is important, I think, to understanding how models translate into the real world. I think that's a really, I think that's a really good point to end on, which is that you know, like we often kind of think about models and kind of like if we have more complex models and more granular data, then like you know that can help us solve the problem. And I think that you know this conversation has basically shown us that really it takes a lot more than just kind of like the model and the data itself. So I'm going to end it on that. I feel like we can have this conversation for hours, but I think we have to move on to the next speaker. Um, so thank you guys so much for um, participating.